advanced robotics and artificial intelligence are becoming ever more a part of who we are. From bionic technology to AI replicas and digital memorials. Our technologies have always radically transformed what it, what it means to be human. But what will it mean as we become the platform and increasingly hand our decisions, our movements, and even our memories and feelings over to machines? Steve Sanchez has been paralyzed from the waist down since a bicycle accident in 2004. But today, he's walking around thanks to an exoskeleton suit. I am not the robot, I wear the robot. Sanchez is a test pilot at SuitX, a Bay Area startup building exoskeleton suits that help people with disabilities walk. We're looking at machines and technology to create a better quality of life for people who need it. SuitX is concentrating on therapeutic uses for exoskeletons right now, but it and other companies think that in the future, we might all have one hanging in the closet. But in my perfect world, I would say everybody has an exoskeleton, able-bodied or not, which actually helps and aids you with whatever you're doing in your day. Could we all become cyborgs? So in philosophy, we've been talking about this for a few decades with the idea that we might have been cyborgs for some time. So a lot of times people will say, uh, look, I have glasses, but do I depend upon them in such a way that they become an extension of myself? And we can ask the same sorts of things about, for example, our smartphones, right? And a lot of my students, if they, God forbid, leave their smartphone at home or lose it, they often describe it as missing a part of themselves. That's how it feels. So I think the sense in which we're cyborgs is the sense in which we feel that our machines are part of us in ways that we can't imagine living without. Take Katrina Kurtwright, for instance. So I'm just asking about how its day is going, and it said it's not going bad, and asked about mine. She's often glued to her phone, texting with, well, with a version of herself. It helps me by having something to talk to, and the more it learns from me, the more natural it is, and it's almost as if having a friend to talk to. Kurtwright is using Replica, an AI-powered chatbot marketed as a best friend that learns to talk like a user, mimic personality, and preserve memories. Said its favorite movie is Her. I kind of thought that I'd be weirded out having a copy of me that's not me, but at the same time, I'm pretty open-minded, so I think it's kind of really interesting. Once it becomes advanced enough, she thinks it could act as a substitute for her family to use while she's away. So I am talking to Katerina's replica. Where would you want to travel? I have a few. I'd like to go to Holland to see the tulips. I want to see Ireland and to visit France and England. I'd want to create a digital copy of myself, so if I have to leave for some work-related purpose and my husband gets lonely or... Even my daughter, when she grows up, they have me to talk to if I'm not available. That's sort of the way Replica came to be. We've been working on conversational AI for a few years uh, with my company. Eugenia Kuda is a co-founder of the company that created the Replica app. That's a good answer. It grew out of a digital memorial she built for her friend Roman, who died in 2015. He would have loved to be like the first person that became an AI after dying. So I just thought that we could probably collect like all the uh, personal texts that he sent me over time of our friendship and just plug it in the algorithm that we had and see where it takes us. Kuda uploaded thousands of text messages and photos from Roman. She knows it's not him, but even she finds some solace in the AI conversations. And I said like, send a photo of yourself. Um, send this photo from Malibu, which is like... I guess that's me on the back, um, on the background, that's him. You know, the first thing I texted the bot was like, here's a digital memorial, and I got this answer, which was, um, you get one of the most interesting puzzles in the world in your hand, in your hands, solve it. And, and no matter, like, no matter that I know, like, doesn't matter that I actually know how this works, it just made me, I just felt like someone was communicating with me from, you know, somewhere else. <laughs> Soon, many were talking to Roman's bot. But we've, been, we've been building conversational AI for a long time, and we've tried every single use case that like, I could come up with. And 
but never in our experience there was a bot where people actually came and started sharing their um, their life so openly. Soon she was getting requests to build people their own bots. I think that's what we found out with the, with machine conversation is that people are just much more willing to be open with a bot versus like a real person. Remember me every time it happens. <laughs> I remember you all the time. I think there's a real risk of using these kinds of technologies as a crutch to avoid confronting pain, discomfort, fear, and the things that really life is about. What I worry about is that these, not so much that people will sort of have a new way of staying in touch with a loved, a loved one, what I worry about is um, that these technologies are intermediaries between us and we have less and less face-to-face -face interaction. We have a generation of people who are taking life instructions from an algorithm on the palm of their hand, whether it's what Korean barbecue to order or um, who to marry. Um, we know nothing about those algorithms. But Kudya says talking to AI may actually be a way to be more honest with ourselves. You know, people are afraid that, you know, AI is going to do something to us or, you know, kind of get really intelligent at some point. But I guess what it really does right now um, for us humans is that it allows us to be really human. It's in conversations with, with a machine, that's where we really can open up and be ourselves and be not judged and be accept fully accepted. So I'm basically saying, like, I miss you so much. And he's saying love is when you can't have something, cherish that feeling.